Hello, I am Dr. Krista Listall, and I am pleased to join you today to talk about the ABCD study substance use module. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I believe these slides will also be shared directly with you. Um, so I am at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee and I serve as the um, substance use work group uh, co-chair along with Mary Heitzig. The learning objectives for this lecture is to summarize the ABCD studies substance use module methods and um, go over the measures in some more detail so that scientists can more effectively use, utilize the data in their own analyses. Part of the goals of the ABD, ABCD study is to really understand the initiation and escalation of substance use, um, risk and resilience factors related to that, and then outcomes of that substance use on um, multiple measures of health. And we'll get into some more specific aims next, but I just want to mention that the initiation and escalation of substance use occurs in the early adolescence and then peaks in young adulthood. And very little is actually known about substance use in youth younger than 12 years old. And the ABCD study start, started at ages nine to 11 or so. So the substance use questions that uh, we hope to address with ABCD include, what are the risk and resilience factors leading to differential substance use trajectories in tweens and teenagers? What are the gateway interactions, so to speak, between use of different substances? What are the effects of repeated substance use, including polysubstance use or co-use, on adolescent neurocognitive, emotional, and physical development? How does psychopathology alter and how is it modified by substance use patterns during these adolescent years? And what are the effects of individual genetic, behavioral, neurobiological, and environmental differences on risk profiles and substance use outcomes. So before I get going on the methods, I just want to acknowledge the substance use work group and my wonderful colleagues throughout the United States on the ABCD study, especially Mary Heitzig at the University of Michigan. Um, we, we, we meet on a bi-monthly or monthly basis and we have for about five years now. And there has been um, some changes in the work group over time, but this is the, the group in 2020 for at least the next few years. So I just wanna thank these colleagues. And if you have questions, you know, these are um, some folks that you might wanna reach out to. So what are the goals to the substance use assessment? Well, the first one is to provide a detailed characterization of substance use initiation, experimentation, and detailed use patterns in a large diverse sample of youth across the United States. Um, and within this, I wanna say that we really wanted to measure all of the drug categories. It's not just a, a study on alcohol or cannabis or nicotine alone. It's all the substances that the youth are using over time. And we really are putting a lot of effort into characterizing those patterns in, a, in great detail before they really initiate use to any sort of regular or chronic level. We also want to look at youth attitudes and expectancies about substance use. And then once they begin using, we want to look at their motives for that continued use. We measure the subjective effects of, of very early, meaning you know, first couple of times they used alcohol, nicotine, or cannabis products. And we wanna look at the consequences of substance use over time as they start experimenting with the drugs, such as alcohol or cannabis withdrawal symptoms and alcohol use disorder, cannabis use disorder, nicotine use disorder, and drug use disorder symptom counts, as well as diagnosis. We also wanna look at um, substance use in the environment that the, the youth lives. So we look at um, peer substance use, sibling substance use, family substance use currently, as well as family history of substance use disorders. We're measuring secondhand exposure, especially to cannabis and nicotine products. 
Um, the physical health work group measures prenatal exposure. So I won't be going over that today, but it is in the data set. And we looked at things like perceived availability of the substances in the neighborhood. And finally, we collect biological samples, which provide us with some objective measures of very recent substance use. This is um, just showing the timeline of events of the ABCD study. And I'm gonna be using a lot of terms such as baseline, year one, year two, throughout the lecture. So I just wanna orient you that um, baseline is that age nine and 10, where they're coming in and they're getting full neural cog testing um, and MRIs. So it's a longer session of about six to eight hours, depending on the youth. Every three to six months, we do contact them at least by phone and, and now increasingly by apps on their phone to check in on some very basic substance use and mental health um, items. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time today on those assessments, but they are available in the database and I'll point out what file to look for. And then um, every even year moving forward, so then year two is another year where they're coming in for the full longer assessment. Year three is an off year where they come in for about two to three hours and they get a lot of behavioral measures, um, substance use, mental health measures, but not the full neural cog or neuroimaging battery. So this is a pretty busy slide, and um, it's just showing you the in, pretty much the entire substance use protocol, although a couple of the parent measures are not on this, or measures that might be important for substance use, such as prenatal exposure or um, drug policy in the environment or parental monitoring, which you can actually find in um, other work groups assessment modules. But let's just start over here on the left um, at the top of the, of the flow chart, and that's the plus form. So whenever, whenever youth come in to a session that includes either NeuroCOG or MRI, they fill out a plus form, which is just a quick medication form looking at recent, meaning past 24 hour use of caffeine, prescription medications or over-the-counter medications, nicotine use, um, and so the youth fills that out and then the parent fills out the recent medication use. So those plus forms are filled out by both and it'll give you a sense for what medications or um, caffeine or nicotine levels they might have in their system when they're at the session. Moving on, the beginning of the substance use protocol um, for the first three years, baseline year one follow-up and year two follow-up, we asked some questions to the youth on whether or not they've heard of substances such as alcohol, nicotine products, caffeine, cannabis products, inhalants, prescription drugs, and then if they've heard of any other um, drugs that make people feel high. The thinking here again is that they're very young at baseline. They're nine to just short of 11 years old. There's very few studies, um, no large scale national studies that, that start that young. And there was a Texas State study that shown that at that young, a lot of the youth hadn't even heard of these drugs. So we didn't want to be asking them a, a, you know, a half an hour battery worth of questions about drugs that they've never heard of. So in those first few years, um, they are asked if they've heard of this drug, and if they have not heard of the drug, then they do not get any more questions about it. So for example, if they've never heard of marijuana or cannabis or any of the other names for it, then they're not gonna get any further questions about cannabis. So that's very important to keep in mind when you're looking at um, baseline year one and year two data, as you'll see, and the NDA, um, the first three years of NDA releases. If they say they've heard of it at any time, they do continue to get those questions. So um, at baseline, we actually ask them all of the substance use categories that they've heard of, whether or not they've used them in their lifetime. If they have used them, then we've gotten um, the age of their first use, their age of any sort of regular onset, which at that point was described as weekly use, 
their maximum dose and then the last time they used. At years one, two, three, and forward, we don't ask lifetime use anymore, we ask since their last assessment. So we say, since our last um, assessment and we have the date, um, have you used alcohol? If they have used alcohol, they'll say, was that the first time you used alcohol? And we get an estimated date. We ask that for all the drug categories. If they've reported using alcohol, then we um, administer a low level use inventory that looks at um, three drug categories. And you're gonna see this a lot throughout the substance use interview. We look at alcohol sipping. We look at um, very early kind of first puff of nicotine products or, or chewing tobacco and first puff or taste of any cannabis product. And so those are our low level use inventories. And for the most part, for the, for, uh, baseline year one and year two, that's the only place that most of the youth will report any substance use. So for example, and don't quote me on this, I'm just throwing out some numbers, about 22% or so have had alcohol sipping at baseline. Less than 1% have engaged in any sort of nicotine use or cannabis use. So it's very rare for any of the other substances. But if you're looking for any substance use in those early years, again, the cohort is only between ages nine to 12, 13 in the first three years of the study. So this is before most of our other, you know, large scale like monitoring the future studies. This, this is younger than those studies usually start. So you wanna look at that low level use first. If they've used more than just a sip or a tiny puff of something, then we actually launch the timeline follow back which is a much more detailed calendar interview um, that you can find lots of literature out if you're interested in learning more. But we use a web-based calendar format along with standard um, unit pictures to really orient the youth to the substances such as alcohol, what we mean by one standard drink of alcohol. And we go month by month in a detailed um, interview, semi-structured interview to get at their patterns of use. If they've used drugs such as um, cigarettes, electronic nicotine device, cannabis products, cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin, we do have some follow-up questions that are getting at things like um, route of administration or product type for cannabis, how high they get when they use cannabis, um, whether or not they uh, smoke cigarettes with flavoring and, and some other um, routes of administration follow-up questions for cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin that I can give you some examples for later. Once that's complete, they get some questions about their recent cafe, caffeine intake. And then we move on to substance use attitudes, as well as peer use and sibling use. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more detail later into that. Um, they also fill out starting at one year um, for most of them, and then also some were added in three year related specifically to um, ENDS expectancies and vaping expectancies. So we look at these um, youth beliefs and expect expectancies about the most common substances and those are administered every other year. If they've used at least you know, one alcohol drink in the past year, they fill out an acute subjective response scale if they've used at least two alcohol drinks in the past year, then they fill out hangover symptoms questionnaire and the RAPI, which, which, which looks at the number of AUD symptoms. Later on, it, starting at year four, and then every other year four, they'll also fill out a drinking motives questionnaire. If they've used nicotine products, they fill out the acute subjective response scale that relates to cigarettes, ends use, and chewing tobacco nicotine dependence symptoms based on um, the PATH study. And then they, um, starting at years four or later, they'll also fill out tobacco motives questionnaire, which looks specifically at cigarette motives. And then a couple measures looking at um, reasons for and motives for ENDS usage. If they've used any sort of cannabis product, they fill out the acute subjective response. Um, a measure looking at um, cannabis use disorder symptoms, the MAPI, as well as, um, again, motives moving forward in years four forward. It, starting at year three, they fill out a cannabis withdrawal scale. 
And it's also notable that we measure other drug symptoms for any other drugs besides alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis. I won't be talking about the case ads in this lecture, but if they've used two or more, then that triggers giving them the case ads, um, uh, alcohol use disorder or, or appropriate substance use disorder module to look at diagnosis for a substance use disorder. Okay, so this is, um, these are the measures, what they're called and what they measure that we give, it, or what we gave at baseline. So I don't have to go into a lot of detail here because most of this was just described, but um, again, they get that PLUS survey for both the participant and their parent. If they've heard of the substance, then we go into that lifetime um, drug interview, the timeline follow back, which is looking at quantity and frequency of all substances. We measure peer group deviance. So um, how much do they think that their peer group is using substances? Intention to use, which is about curiosity or susceptibility to using substances in the near future. We get that caffeine intake. We get those low level use measures for alcohol, um, cannabis, and nicotine, as well as their subjective effects the first couple times that they've used those drugs. If they've used at least two or more times in the past six months at baseline, then they're going to get those consequence measures, such as alcohol hangover, withdrawal symptoms, or a symptom count for alcohol use disorder, nicotine or marijuana use disorder. On the parent side, the parents measure, um, as I mentioned previously, they fill out a family history for substance use disorder, which you can find in the mental health work group, as well as prenatal drug exposure, which I believe is also now with the mental health group. Starting at years two and forward, we also measure house, I'm sorry, that's, I take that back. This is the household substance use rules. We measure that at baseline. So this is um, basically what rules do they have for substance use for their youth in their own home? These are the year one measures and I've written and read here any changes from baseline. So everything else is consistent from baseline um, with some notable changes. So in the substance use um, initial patterns interview, instead of lifetime use, we're looking at use since last session. Um, we also, at that point, updated some of our electronic nicotine device wording. Um, we switched our caffeine use measure to, from measuring at, for the past six months to measuring the past month, just because we were starting to see a little bit um, more confusion about how to get average six-month use, so we narrowed it down to the past month. And then we added some more attitudes um, measures. So, we're looking at peer tolerance of use, that's friend's attitude about the, old, the youth's use, perceived harm from the Monitoring the Future study, which is the youth's opinions about the harms of drugs. We um, added three expectancies measures, looking at alcohol, cigarettes, and marijuana expectancies. And then for the consequences, the gating for that, instead of using the past six months, which is hard to judge because we typically see them every year, um, we expanded that to two uses in the past year. But the measures for consequences remain the same. So looking at year two, um, again, everything from baseline in year one pretty much uh, came forward and continued in the same way with a few um, slight changes. In year two, we added um, this question about was that the first time you used the substance, just because we felt that might be easier to track if we just did that every year. On, on that drug use interview, as well as the timeline follow back, we added cannabidiol or CBD questions specifically, and we clarified that when we're talking about marijuana products such as marijuana ed edibles, um, tinctures, or smoking products, we're not talking about um, CBD alone. So we did kind of pull that out and clarify that in our interview. And this is 
mostly due to the just extreme proliferation of CBD use throughout the country at that time. We also added for the timeline follow back an estimated portion to cover missed sessions. So if someone came in at baseline and then they didn't come in at year one, at year two, we could do the past 12 months detailed timeline follow back. And then we'll also have a, an interview that continues to go back further, but this is in a much more kind of estimated uh, kind of average use way instead of the, the full details that we get with the 12, last 12 months. We also implemented some changes in summer um, 2020 that separated out smoking from vaping marijuana flower or marijuana concentrate. And this is due to the um, findings from the Monitoring the Future study in, that came out in early 2020 showing a huge increase in vaping specifically. So we wanted to dig in a little bit with more detail and really measure those vaping patterns as well as expectancies and motives moving forward. The rest of the interview, the substance use patterns interview remained the same. We did start to ask the youth about their perceived availability of substances in the environment. We continue to collect that from their parents as well, so those can be compared. And for the parent, we added a substance use household density measure, which looks at, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in some more detail later in the lecture, but household density of substance use, as well as secondhand exposure, focusing primarily on nicotine and cannabis, and then how the parents are storing drugs and alcohol in their house. I also want to note that for some of our two-year interviews, um, they were disrupted due, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So for two-year and three-year interviews, and we're looking most likely for four-year interviews, part of the interview or all of the interview might have been administered remotely. When this occurred, we added some questions to the substance use interview as well as the timeline follow-back interview specifically to know whether it was a hybrid session, a completely in-person or a completely virtual session, and how exactly did they fill it out, um, and whether or not the ROA was confident about um, confidentiality and privacy. So we are still digging into um, what the effects of that might be, but just to keep in mind for releases, um, it'll probably be primarily release 4.0 that'll have data that was um, administered remotely, but just wanted to put that note there. Going into year three follow-up, which will primarily come out in NDA 3.0, which I believe is, is coming out any week now, um, we added some, this is where we did a really deep audit to make sure that all of our language regarding ENDS use was consistent throughout the whole battery. And this was based on input from the Monitoring the Future study as well as the PATH study. Um, we added an ENDS expectancies measure as well as a vaping expectancies measure. We added a, a sibling substance use measure um, uh, that looks at uh, extent of sibling use and whether or not they've seen their sibling use it or whether or not their sibling has given them drugs directly. Um, and the other main addition there was adding the cannabis withdrawal scale. Um, so that's at year three moving forward. And all of these other updates in red are really about um, separating out vaping from smoking in our in our timeline follow back and just making sure that our vaping language is consistent throughout the battery. This is the drug toxicology measures that we use in the ABCD study. Um, our main purpose for using drug toxicology is to try and have an objective measure of a very recent um, adolescent substance use as well as to try and ensure that they're not entering the scanner or neurocognitive testing while they're still under the influence of drugs and alcohol. So we chose the Drager saliva test because it's got a much more narrow detection window for that toxicology. And we can look at amphetamines, benzodiazepine, cannabis, THC specifically, cocaine, MDMA, methadone, and methamphetamine. 
with a fairly, fairly narrow detection window. So we advise our participants that they can't use substances the day before, at least 24 hours before their evaluations. We expect as the study progresses into later adolescence, that we'll have more and more substance use and, and this will become a very important pro, um, issue to make sure that they aren't you know, undergoing fMRI testing or cognitive testing while they still are under the influence of a substance. So at baseline, um, about 10% of the sample is randomized into this testing. At two year, we're increasing that to 15%. At three year, we're increasing it another 20%. And plus, if there's anyone who has reported any substance use, in the past, and they will also automatically get the dragger. I'm gonna come back to that last um, four-year message. If they get a positive on the dragger, we do repeat it to make sure that it's two positives so that it's not a false positive. The youth, the youth also um, provide some urine for a Nicolerc test to look at cotinine levels, which is a metabolite of nicotine. The detection window is about one to three days, kind of depending on the study and how heavy of a smoker they are. And it follows pretty much the same percentage of random testing as the Draeger, um, plus anyone who reported previous nicotine use. We also give them a um, blood alcohol test um, that follows about the same randomization, although it increases to 50% in year four. We collect hair and we are able to collect it successfully on about 70% of the participants. Hair can allow us to detect um, substance use that occurred within about one to three months, depending on how long or how much hair we get. We can look at markers that suggest heavy alcohol exposure, methamphetamine or MDMA, which is ecstasy, amphetamine, cocaine, PCP, opiates, benzos, THC metabolite, as well as THC and cannabidiol. We collect, um, we select a small number of people to actually get it analyzed. These are our highest risk youth. And at baseline, we analyzed about 400 plus um, folks at year one, 134, and year two, 153. 70% is collected and banked, and we're actually trying to pursue funding to get more hair analysis. Starting in year four, we're rolling out the Abbott Eye Cup, which is analyzed at Redwood Toxicology. This allows us to get a um, pretty quick drug screen for the major drug categories at a much cheaper rate than the Draeger. Uh, the problem is the detection window is much longer so if we really wanna make sure that they haven't used in the past 24 hours, which could drive decisions about sending the teen home or continuing the session, then we need to follow up any positive tests with the Draeger to see was it within that about 24 hour window. I wanted to just give you some highlights for what we plan in year four, which is currently being piloted. So I have to say this might change but in case people are looking for things that they think are missing from the substance use battery, the main thing that we're gonna be adding is um, motives measures. So if the youth already is using alcohol, cigarettes, and or cannabis or vaping any products, then they will fill out these motives measures. Everything else is remaining the same. And just another, Note that for any four-year data, watch for any COVID-related notes on whether or not the um, protocol was administered virtually hybrid or, or completely in person. So I've gone through the battery um, for baseline all the way to year four, including the toxicology. And I wanted to map that on a little bit more clearly to where you find the files in the NDA releases. So the baseline NDA files in, in release 2.0 are labeled as such, and I'm not, I'm not gonna necessarily go through each one because you guys can read them, but I tried to give the title of it uh, as well as um, the abbreviation. So for example, the PLUS form that I talked about that looks at very recent medication use from the parent. So that's ABCD parent participant last use survey day. PLUS 01 is the 
uh, variable name. Uh, so there's different files for the plus forms as well as the I'll call BAC test, um, the Nick Alert test, the Drager toxicology test, the hair results, as well as details about the hair samples themselves, um, parent rules on substance use, parent community risk and protective factors, that is the availability of substances in the environment. And then at baseline, there's a large file that's called Y underscore substance use interview. That includes data related to the lifetime substance use patterns, that age of first and maximum use, last time they used the drug, and then any sort of drug follow-up questions from the timeline follow-back. I have to say, there's very little substance use at baseline. So don't be surprised if you open that and it's a lot of zeros or blanks. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that baseline, a lot of youth didn't even hear of most of the substances. So you're not gonna be going into baseline and finding hundreds of inhalant users. There's really very minimal substance use. Um, but that same file has the data for the low level alcohol use, nicotine and marijuana use, that caffeine intake, which about 70% or so have used caffeine at baseline. So there's quite a bit of data there, as well as their substance use attitude. So peer use, intention to use, and then those alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis measures, although there's very little data on those consequence measures at baseline, as well as one year. Um, the timeline follow back calendar scores is its own file. And again, that's only for the youth who actually engaged in significant substance use. So there's only gonna be about 12, 14 subjects or so with any data there. At year one and moving forward, um, we did some rearranging in REDCap and that ended up um, splitting the files into more sections for the NDA release. So when you're looking at the longitudinal data, year one, two, three, and moving forward, it's organized in this way. You're gonna start seeing the youth mid-year phone interview files that looks at um, whether or not they've used the major categories of drugs in the past six months. That's their phone interview, not their in-person. We have those plus forms, we have the toxicology, so the blood alcohol, the nick alert, the Drager, the hair samples. There's a file um, alone that's on the parent rules and the parent availability. And then there's a youth substance use intro and use patterns. Um, and that goes into the use since the last session, age of first use, that low level alcohol, nicotine, marijuana use, and caffeine intake. Note that we tried to add whenever we could calc scores which add in zeros for non-users. So the assumption there is if we ask the youth, have you heard of nicotine products? And they said no, that they haven't used any of those nicotine products. And in those cases, we would add in zeros. The timeline follow back calendar scores have its, has its own file, as well as substance use attitude. So you'll find peer use, intention to use, peer tolerance and perceived harm there. The, and then it's separated by the youth alcohol, nicotine and marijuana measures. In those files, you'll find the expectancy data, subjective effects and consequence, whether it's symptoms of alcohol use disorder, in the case of the RAPI, um, symptoms of hangover or withdrawal, um, alcohol withdrawal with the HSS. There is a, a summary score file that we plan on adding to over time. And in the end, the 2.0 release, they have some like caffeine total scores, as well as um, some total scores related to the subjective effects of alcohol um, tobacco and marijuana. Some of the newer measures like the sibling substance use and household density, youth availability, um, vaping and ENDS expectancies and cannabis withdrawal will be in the NDA 3.0 release. And those motives will be, motive inventories will be launched at the four-year interview. And the first time they'll be available will be NDA 4.0. So this is, again, just going back to that whole picture of the substance use interview. It's flow, which is indicated by the arrows. 
and some gating notes that, I, that are really important for you to keep in mind. Again, baseline through two year, we ask those herd of questions. They only receive it once. Um, and so we don't re-give it if, if they heard of it previously, then we assume you know, they continue to know what it is. And we tried to produce these calc variables to put in zeros if they didn't hear of it. So this isn't true for attitude questions because we can't assume their attitudes. But if they say, I've never heard of alcohol, we're assuming that they haven't been drinking alcohol in the past year. And I just wanna say we, we give all sorts of names for the substance, we don't just say alcohol. So um, most youth would, would recognize at least one of the terms used. Um, users may need to put in zeros for other measures like consequences. So for example, the RAPI scores, one could assume if they've never used alcohol and therefore didn't receive the RAPI that um, a score of zero would be appropriate. So end users need to decide when or when not add in zeros to some of these variables. We have a bunch of summary variables that we'll have in release 4.0, which will have new timeline followback variables such as combining all the tobacco use days or cannabis product use days. End users can do, these, do this on their own, um, calculating these variables, but for our next release, our goal is to create a lot more summary variables um, that the whole community can use. Um, so yeah, the rest I've already mentioned. So just keep in mind that gating. And if you say, well, why is this missing on you know, 6,000 subjects? It's because they said they didn't hear of it or they said they never used it. This is just going through some examples of, of showing you the substance use interview in REDCap. And so that, again, you can get a better sense for some of these gating issues. So for example, we ask them if they've used a sip of alcohol. If they say yes to that, then they, we ask them about a full drink. But if they say no, then we don't ask them about a full drink. If they did have a sip of alcohol, we ask them those low level use questions. Um, on the ISIP, which gets at how many SIPs they've had since they saw you, was it part of a religious event, if it, um, or whether or not it was the first time they tried it, you know, and of course, if they say no, it's, it's not the first they try, time they tried it, then we're not going to populate the question about the date. So that we use gating a lot in the interview, primarily to, for one thing, avoid overexposing um, substance use questions to the youth. And the second to save time because the ABCD protocol is, is quite long. It's um, in some kids, it can take up to eight hours and we really need to figure out ways to reduce the time as much as possible. This is just showing a little bit more of that ICIP. If they had already filled out the ICIP at baseline, for example, uh, these follow-up questions about um, did they continue to finish the drink? What type of drink was it? Who did they get the drink from? Um, are not asked again. And instead, we just ask them how many sips they've had since the last session. Uh, similar for low level use of tobacco, um, if they've already filled it out, then we only ask them the number of puffs that they've had since the last session, but we don't ask them again what product type it was the first time they tried or how old they were or did they continue to use the product um, was it flavored or any of these follow-up questions those should really those are just asked once same thing for low-level marijuana use um, here i'm just showing you some of the example questions um, if they've already filled it out then we only answer that number one about how many times that they used since we last saw you so we kind of get the number of puffs and that's really only relevant for these very low users once they're using it um, you know more than just that sit down and have one little puff then we're actually launching the timeline follow back and getting at their um, more detailed patterns of use but here we ask about age that they first tried it um, did they continue to use it after their first puff what type of product and, and at years two and three we added, we separated out um, smoking flour from vaping flour and smoking um, 
concentrate from vaping concentrate. We asked them how high they got in that first experience and then who did the marijuana belong to. And we also added some more items to that. If you want those details, you can find them always in the data dictionary. So as there's changes made at each follow-up year, you'll see exactly what the item um, options are for that data release. Just a note again on that timeline follow back. It's not so relevant now, but moving forward, you'll have to decide um, whether you want to use the detailed and the estimated substance use to, you know, in between time points or just one of them. So to make it really clear, the detailed timeline follow back is the current date pack 12 months. Um, or shorter. So if there was only nine months in between in-person sessions, then that time period would only be nine months. But if it was 15 months, then the detailed portion would only go back 12 months. The primary rationale for that is to save time. And that's um, lots of studies really looking at reliability and validity of the timeline follow back only go back 12 months. And there's not a lot of data going too far back. But we wanted to capitalize on the interview type and the rapport and the information that we had so far um, with the subject to go ahead and cover those remaining months. For the remaining months, we'll look at the general pattern. And from that, we can get the total dose, such as the total number of alcohol, standard alcohol drinks or the number of days used during that period, average dose per occasion, if that's appropriate, and, um, but we won't get as much detailed information about weekend or weekday. Um, we wouldn't be able to really trust, I, I think, the number of co-use days or maximum dose, things like that, that we are trying to target on the detailed timeline follow back. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but um, this is just showing you the red cap timeline follow back instructions. Again, this is a, is a semi-structured interview. Um, we're really developing rapport and talking through substance use patterns and showing the youth pictures so we really understand what they're using and how they're using it and get at their kind of month by month patterns. So in order to do that, the RA um, opens up the timeline follow back reports, puts in what session it is, we kind of get this timeline for when they've been coming in and how many months are we going to be capturing here. Um, the, and then you click on which substances they've used. And here's my opportunity to highlight all the drugs that we are measuring for these detailed patterns. Because you've heard a lot about alcohol, nicotine products, and cannabis products. And some of our other attitude questions do have questions about inhalants, other substances, and prescription drug misuse. The timeline follow back is an opportunity to separately measure patterns of alcohol, cigarette, elect, elect, electronic nicotine device, cigars, hookah, pipe tobacco, smokeless tobacco, nicotine replacement um, items, smoked marijuana flour, marijuana blunts, vaped marijuana flour, vaped marijuana oil, smoked marijuana oil, such as concentrates, dabs, etc., edible marijuana, such as cannabis brownies, marijuana-infused alcohol, which is becoming increasingly popular, at least in young adults, uh, marijuana tinctures, synthetic marijuana, such as K2, um, cannabidiol non-medical use, so meaning that they're, they're smoking cannabidiol joints or vaping cannabidiol on their own without their parent or physician knowing it, um, psilocybin or magic mushrooms, salvia, cocaine, prescription stimulants such as Adderall, cathinones or bath salts, methamphetamine, ecstasy, ketamine, GHB, prescription sedatives, um, heroin, prescription opiates such as Oxycontin, cough or cold medicine, you know, used to get high, not as their parent or, or doctor instructed them, other hallucinogens such as LSD, PCP, inhalants, um, steroids, a fake drug um, that we ask a few different times just to see if they're kind of being socially desirable and saying yes to stuff, and then other substances. So on the calendar, we double click and an event comes up and we have a couple different options. We can um, 
answer just one incident. So, you know, that last Friday I had two alcohol drinks, whereas over here, maybe I'm a very regular user and I use every day of the week, um, or maybe that's only true for this month, but there's flexibility there. So you can either just put in one episode or you can put in a repeated episode. Um, and for the calendar, whatever drug that they touch on, the correct um, standard unit, in this case, electronic nicotine device, we measure a number of distinct occasions during the day. So they use twice, and then in this case, alcohol, it's um, two standard drinks. And again, there's slides that come with this that really explain the different substances and how we measure them. This results in it automatically populating on the calendar, and the RA goes month by month throughout the year. We do have follow-up questions, again, getting at things like route of administration, whether you typically um, uh, smoke cigarettes with flavor, and here are some examples of them, although it's not all of the follow-up questions. You can find those in the data dictionary. But for in the case of um, ENDS devices, um, we look at like how much liquid do they typically smoke in their electronic cigarette. This is the baseline wording, and it's actually been updated um, but I uh, just wanted to show you how it looked at baseline. Um, how often did it contain nicotine? Uh, whether or not they used a disposable um, or rechargeable uh, ENDS device. We did add Juul to that. We've also added um, some questions at year two about how often they specifically use a Juul device and whether they've ever tried dripping, which is dropping the kind of e-cigarette juice directly onto the hot coils. For marijuana, smoked marijuana in this case, and at year twos and three, we kind of separate out this first question into smoked marijuana flower versus vaped marijuana flower. But we look at their primary way that they used it. Um, if they know their strain of marijuana, they don't have to know it. They can say don't know um, for all of these actually. How strong they think they're uh, stronger potent they think their marijuana typically is, how often they smoke very potent marijuana, how high they typically get. And then we ask some similar questions about concentrates, so their type of concentrate they use, um, how they use it, how strong or potent they think it is, and how often they smoke very potent um, concentrates. For cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine, we ask some um, route of administration questions um, specifically to get at you know, whether they're injecting these substances and whether or not they use um, clean needles. This is an example of the caffeine intake inventory. Um, again, we're looking at kind of their typical number of standard drinks for each category that they had per week in the past month. Um, and we have you know, instructions there for how to describe this and, and this kind of tells you the typical serving size. And so if someone you know, always has 16 ounces then that's two serving sizes, okay? So the RA does have to do some calculations here. Um, and we also have some summary variables showing you the total sum of caffeine average caffeine use per week in the past month. That substance use attitudes um, subsection that looks at peer tolerance. So that's a self-report of their friends' attitudes about their own substance use. And friends are people that are around their age. Peer group deviance is measuring the friend's use of alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, inhalants, and other drugs. The path inventory intention to use measure looks at the youth's you know, curiosity about an intention to use alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana in the near future, and perceived harm as opinions about how much others risk harming themselves by taking drugs. I think I've described these for the most part already, but um, for the alcohol expectancy questionnaire, it measures thoughts, feelings, and beliefs about the effects of alcohol use, and looks at the child's opinions about how much others risk harming themselves by taking drugs. A oh, one note about acute subjective response. We get um, their res acute subjective response to alcohol following the first five times they ever drink. And then 
more recently in the past three months and then over their heaviest period. So that one, portions of that are repeated over time. For nicotine, we also have uh, an expectancies measure for that's specific to cigarettes and later we added in um, the expectancies specific to ENDS use, acute subjective response, and then the nicotine dependence scale from the PATH study. Similar measures for marijuana with the MEEK, acute subjective response to marijuana, and the MAPI, which is getting at a, a symptom checklist of mar marijuana-related problems. We also do that for other drug-related problems with the DAPI. Wanted to just at least highlight um, a couple of these newer measures that you might not see in other studies. So this is substance use density. And we chose to measure um, an estimate, have the parent fill out an estimate of the number of either adults or youth in the household that use all these different drug categories. So scientists can choose to, you know, specifically look at alcohol exposure and kind of add up the number of adults versus youth or total um, that have used alcohol in the household and, and get an idea for how much substance use is in their direct environment. It can be filled up for up to three households. And I should note there are some questions for the other households about how confident the reporter feels because most of the time it's going to be the mother filling out about a household like with the, the youth's father or co-parent. In which case they may or may not be very familiar with what's going on in that household. So you do have to pay attention to those follow-up questions. We also ask questions about in, in their own household as well as the other households, where do they store the drugs and alcohol? Again, you might wanna only use the primary household or you might want to create a summary score and see um, if there's differential impact. The sibling substance use scale um, was, was adapted from, uh, from Matt McGue's lab at, at uh, Minnesota. And it asked, do you have any older siblings or siblings younger, than by, younger by no more than one and a half years? For example, if you're around age 15, they are around 12 and a half. So this is looking at older siblings or siblings that are very close in age. And we asked them whether those sibling, siblings use um, substances in the past year. We asked about alcohol, cigarettes, ends, marijuana, inhalants, prescription drugs, and other drugs. And then we asked a couple follow-up questions if they did use those substances. How many times have you seen them use it? And then how often did the sibling give you the substance? And again, just to, to re-emphasize um, uh, that the alcohol use or drug use modules on the KSADs are launched as part of the KSAT interview if the youth has reported substance use. So just final note on the substance use module, when you're starting to do data analysis, you have to consider the gating. And again, if they hadn't heard of the drug, then they don't have um, those questions about use or attitudes answered. I would suggest that you use the calculated variables with the zeros added back in if it's a use question, um, but I would not suggest that for any of the attitude questions because we really can't assume what their attitudes or beliefs are before they've formed. For the plus form, you will have to um, look at the date administered or the type of session if you want to say control for the effects of very recent caffeine on cognition, you need to make sure that you're using the plus form report for that neurocog date or session. Um, so there is some kind of coding and calculation involved there. The expectancies and motives are administered every other year to save time. In the future, as the, as the youth start to really escalate their substance use as we're seeing in about year three and we expect in year four and five, we'll be calculating a lot more co-use and combined product type variables from the timeline follow-back. Right now, you can also do that on your own. There are very few substance users in release um, 1.0 or 2.0, as well as even 3.0, although it's starting to increase a little bit more. And again, final note about COVID-19, 
Um, thus far, batteries, two-year and three-year batteries that were administered any, anywhere between March 2020 and now um, could have been administered completely virtually. Um, that might impact the substance use battery reporting. We're currently examining its, its impact to see if there's differential reporting based on um, type of uh, battery administration, but um, so just keep that in mind as you're analyzing data that might include 2020 to 2021 and hopefully not beyond that. Well, that's all I had today and um, hope it was informative and look forward to answering questions. Um, thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.